Want to honor shelf exams while scoring 260 plus on step two and passing step one? Studying for all of them after long hospital days will fail. I know because I tried it. But after helping thousands of med students, I found the top performers use a totally different system. Their way gets better scores while others burn out and panic. Today, I'll show you eight simple strategies to ace all these exams without the crushing stress most students face. This system won't just save your scores, it might just save your sanity. Let's get started. Strategy number one is the morning revolution. Most students try to study after hospital work. That's why they fail at board prep during clerkships. Studying after a long day in the hospital sounds good, but almost never works. Instead, morning study will change everything. To understand this, let's figure out why evening study typically fails. Einstein said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. Before they start clerkships, most people think that they'll just be able to come home after a long day in the hospital and do a few hours of studying. The issue is, is that after you've been on your feet for hours, either in the OR retracting or on the floor for medicine, your brain is too tired to learn. I'm just gonna do a few questions after work. Sounds easy, but almost no one can actually do it. The best way to figure out what kind of study you should be is to ask yourself this question. Will I be able to study more effectively after a long day in the hospital or before it? If you're like most people, studying before a long day in the hospital is going to be much better. The next question is, how do you actually do it? To actually study in the morning, most people think that they just need to wake up early. In fact, that's not true. So the key to wake up early and study early in the morning is actually to go to bed early, not necessarily to wake up early. Admittedly, this can lead to some pretty extreme schedules. We've had students who have gone to bed as early as 7 p.m. so that they could wake up as early as 3 or 4 a.m. The key is, is that you should get a full eight hours of sleep. I know this sounds crazy, but let me repeat this again. I had a student recently who had never ever honored a shelf exam before. She wanted to match into dermatology, so she needed to get both honors in her last shelf exams, and she also wanted to get a 260 plus on her step two. To help them maximally, we monitor students closely, so I knew exactly how many questions and how many flashcards and how many videos she was watching every single day. She was doing about 30 questions a day, watching two videos, and she was making about 50 Anki cards while doing all of her old Anki cards every single day. What was even more remarkable is that she did this while she was on internal medicine and on surgery, and she was getting eight full hours of sleep. Now you might think that she was just a genius, but again, remember she had never honored a shelf exam before in her life. After only two months of working together, her first NBME of dedicated was a 257. She ended up with a 265 on step two after only about a month of dedicated studying. Now, why do I bring this up? Because eight hours of sleep is your secret weapon. She was religious about getting eight full hours of sleep every single day. This seems crazy when you're busy, but sleep is actually when learning gets locked in. You're probably thinking, I don't have time to sleep more. The issue with that, in reality, when I tell myself that, it is almost always the reverse. In other words, because I'm not sleeping more, I do not have time. When I'm not sleeping enough, doing anything, including learning and studying, takes much longer. But morning study only works if you study it the right way. Let's talk about strategy number two, one topic at a time. Most students make one big mistake with board prep that dooms them to fail. Their mistake is that they try to cover everything without knowing anything particularly well. Instead, you wanna master one topic fully before you move on. To understand this, let's look at how panic actually hurts your scores. We work with a lot of students who regret earlier ways that they studied. They wish that they covered more, they wish they had had a system for retaining the information better. Whatever their regrets, they often carry the guilt and the belief that they need to make up for lost time. They're like, oh my gosh, I have to study for shelf exams and step two and maybe even step one all at once. They come home with this idea that there's going to be some magic schedule that's going to allow them to study for all of the step one questions that they need to do and all the step two questions that they want to do and all of the shelf exam questions that they want to do. But in reality, they're trying to chase too many rabbits and they're catching none of them. The issue is, is that their panic and stress are causing them to either freeze up and not get a lot done or to rush through way too much content and not learn any of it in detail. In either case, not studying enough or studying too much too fast lead to failure. Someone told me recently that they'd done UL twice as if it was evidence that they must know the content really well because they had already done two passes. To be blunt, if you did two passes of UL and you didn't get your goal score, you probably weren't doing it right. The problem isn't how much you cover, instead it's how well you learn it. Real learning takes time and focus, not just exposure to facts. Instead, I recommend that you test small and then grow. So what does that mean? 
First, start with one topic like coronary artery disease. Learn it fully, meaning go through the first aid page that's relevant to it, make flashcards connecting all of the facts and understand the key concepts, and make sure that you understand it deeply. You want to prove that your study method works first on a small topic before you go ahead and cover the rest of all of the other topics. To test yourself, use five question subtopic blocks on coronary artery disease until you reach 80% correct on 10 consecutive questions. Just like they do in Silicon Valley, you want to make sure that your plan works first with a small test before you scale it up. If you're worried that you're not going to cover everything, remember that it's better to learn 60% of the material really, really well, where you can get at least 80% of it, than to try to rush through and get 100%, but still only score 40% on it. Let me explain why 80% mastery can change everything. If you focus on one subtopic at a time, you can typically find that students can go from 0 or 20% all the way to 80% or even 100% in a single day of focused study. The key is, is that you want to anticipate any question that they might ask you on the exam. To do that, find the appropriate page or pages in first aid for that given topic and learn everything in that section. In addition, and this is critical, you want to make flashcards to ensure that you never forget what it is that you learn. One of the biggest reasons that we see students struggle is that they move on way too quickly before they are able to see their scores go up. Because of this, doing UWorld or other QBanks just feels like a huge grind. How motivated do you think you're going to feel if you're constantly seeing scores in the 40 or 50 or maybe even just 60%? Instead, if you can get 80 or 100% on a topic in just a day, how much better do you think you're going to feel and how much more reassured that you're on the right path that you're going to feel. This approach ends anxiety by proving to yourself that you can succeed. This brings us to strategy number three, focus on what's in front of you. Remember, your rotation is your board prep it's not a distraction from it. Trying to study for everything at once is why most students feel overwhelmed and burn out. The stress you feel isn't because you can't do it, it's because you're trying to do too much at once. The single best way to predict your IM score is actually your step one performance. In other words, how you do on any one of the shelf exams is going to directly impact how it is you do on the other exams, even step one and step two. Where most people go wrong is they think, okay, well, internal medicine is about 2,000 U world questions, and step one has almost 4,000 U world questions, and the rest of my step to QBank has another almost 2,000 questions. They think that they should be doing a little bit from all of these sources, but the math just doesn't work out. Trying to do too much means you'll accomplish very little. Instead, you want to focus on mastering what's in front of you, because remember, it helps all three exams. So what should you do? Focus on your current rotation's content. If you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed with how much you're trying to accomplish in your day, it may be that your approach needs to change, not you. It's the belief that you must study for all the exams simultaneously, which is actually holding you back. In general, when you feel overwhelmed, your approach is wrong, not your ability. I know for a lot of us, especially those who've struggled on standardized exams, it can be really easy to think that there's something wrong with us. So if we're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, it's easy to just blame ourselves and say, oh, well, it's because I'm too lazy or I'm not getting enough done or worrying that it's somehow our inadequacies that are holding us back. Instead, students who honor focus on the shelf exam that's in front of them. And as long as you're making good Anki cards so that you never forget the material and doing those cards, you can trust that mastering your current rotation helps for all three exams. But why exactly does focusing on your current rotation work for all exams. That's where strategy four comes in, the 80% overlap truth. What I'm about to show you will change how you think about step one, step two, and shelf exams forever. At least 80 to 90% of step one material shows up on shelf exams and step two. Most students waste time studying the same stuff twice. Why? Because most students think that they need different study plans for each exam. Remember, step two is really just a collection of all of your shelf scores. So if step one is the single best predictor of step two scores, the actual overall best predictor of step two scores is the average of your shelf exams for internal medicine, surgery, and either OB or peds. Even if we just think of step one, try to name the step one topics that don't show up on step two. There's actually very few. Most step one material will show up in step two and shelf exams in some way or another. Most students waste time because they treat them all as separate exams. Here's just a few examples of basic science and clinical practice. On OB, you'll learn about acute fatty liver of pregnancy. To understand this, you really need to understand glycolysis and fatty acid oxidation. To understand DKA, you have to understand ketogenesis and gluconeogenesis, which are both very much biochemistry step one topics. Pediatrics also brings back many pure step one topics like glycogen storage diseases or lysosomal storage diseases. This doesn't even touch on the obvious observation that the organ systems for step one form the core of virtually every single shelf exam and for step two. Remember, the basic science of step one isn't abstract. Instead, it's the grammar of clinical medicine. What seems like step one stuff actually shows up in clinical cases all the time. This is actually wonderful news. What this means is you can study for everything all at once. Shelf exams, clerkships, step one, and step two. As my Stanford advisor would always say, chase one rabbit, catch it, 
chase two, catch neither. If you can learn the concepts well once, you can apply them many, many times again across all the exams. But even with morning study focused on the right topics, you need to use your hospital time well. That's where strategy five comes in the hospital computer ninja mode. The secret to crushing all three exams is using Anki during hospital downtime, but never on your phone. If you study on your phone in the hospital, everyone thinks you're slacking off, even if you're working hard. It's kind of like if someone goes to a strip club and they say that they're doing it for the food. Even if it's true, no one will ever believe you. Instead, you wanna use the hidden study time that most students miss. Remember, while the hours in the hospital are long, Hospital days have many five to 15 minute gaps that when you add them all up together can add up to more than one or two hours of study time every day. These small breaks seem useless by themselves but become powerful with the right plan. So how do you take advantage of this time? If you've been making Anki cards for the entire subject of the things that you don't know, you wanna do those Anki cards now during the day on a hospital computer. The goal is to be done with your Anki cards by the time that you get home. That way, your two or three hours of studying in the morning before you go into the hospital can be used strictly on questions and making cards. And by the time that you get home, you're gonna have very little to do. If you wanna be extra effective at doing your Anki cards in the hospital, try keeping your Anki window inside one of the EMR windows, like if you're using Epic. So to do this, go to AnkiWeb.net on one of the hospital computers. It'll sync with your phone app, so make sure that you have an AnkiWeb account and that account is synced with your phone or other devices. Then you want to resize the window and put it within one of the Epic or other EMR windows. On PCs, you can use Alt-Tab to quickly switch between programs, which will allow you to seamlessly transition between both programs, either if someone's walking behind you or if you need to check lab values or something like that in Epic. Because we're resizing it and putting it within one of the Epic windows, unless someone looks closely, they won't necessarily see your flashcards. Bite-sized learning fits perfectly in the chaotic hospital environment. Remember, typically each card should take less than a minute or two, perfect for short breaks. Well-used hospital computers can double your daily study time. But to pull this off without hurting your clinical grades, you need strategy number six, the follow-up list technique. This follow-up list method will transform how your team sees your computer time. Because the student who checks labs every 30 minutes is more valuable than the one who just holds retractors. One of the biggest problems with clinical grades is your team's impression of you. Burned out residents become cynical about students on computers, and how your team sees you affects a big part of your grade. As a consequence, you need to study in a way that avoids dirty looks and bad evaluations. Even if you're doing your Anki cards, being caught studying can even hurt your grades unless you use this method. This will allow you to balance your learning with helping the team and show how great a med student you are. So what is the follow-up list method? When I was an incoming intern, there was an outgoing resident that told us that there were two kinds of people in the hospital. There are people that make lists, and there are people that f The reason is, is that you never want to let things fall through the crack. To make your list, during rounds, write down all the things that need follow-up later that day. These would be things like troponins or other labs that need to be trended, test results, consult notes, or radiology reads. If you want to be both valuable to your team and to get studying done, sit down at a computer and then check every 15 to 30 minutes on things that you can look up from that computer. So let's say that there's a creatinine that needs to come back normal before you can discharge a patient. You sit there at the computer and every 15 or 20 or 30 minutes, you just hit refresh on the labs. When the lab comes back, you tell the intern or the resident, hey, the lab just came back, do you want to see it? And then you turn the computer towards them. As you tell them it's normal and they approach you, they're going to be thinking in their head, wow, this student is amazing. They are helping me so much and taking things off of my plate. You'll be helping your team and you'll be showing them that your computer time is valuable. Rather than associating you on your computer with things like doing Anki cards or studying, they're going to think of you at the computer as something that's making their day better. And let's be honest, to actually check the labs themselves, it doesn't take that much time. For all the rest of the time, you can sit there doing your Anki cards or making new cards or just in general studying things and keeping on track of patient care or in general staying on top of your studies. If you help your team get stuff done, it's going to not only help your clinical grades, but it'll also give you more freedom to study during downtime. Now that you know how to study in the hospital, let's talk about exactly what to focus on during each rotation. Strategy number seven is rotation gold mines. Each rotation gives you a special chance to master content for your shelf exam, step one and step two, all at once. If you're studying for step one, for example, you want to only study the step one material that matches your current rotation. Remember, trying to study everything at once will make you fail. For example, if you're on neurology or psych rotations, you would want to study only the neurology or psych material. 
If you're studying for step one, the thing that you don't want to do is to come home from a long day of neurology and then try to do biochemistry questions or anatomy questions. Overall, for your step one or step two exam, neurology or psych might only be five to eight percent of the total test. However, if you learn that five to eight percent and you make really good flashcards and never ever forget it, you'll never have to deal with that subject again. The key is, is that you want to keep reviewing your old subjects with Anki for the things that you've already studied previously. Remember, the hardest part isn't studying, it's limiting what you study to what matters now. Now. So what exactly should you study on each rotation? When you're on internal medicine, you'll want to cover all organ systems and microbiology. Internal medicine and the shelf exam is basically the organ systems from step one. It also comprises much of the core content for both step one and step two. For surgery, it's going to be very similar. You're going to cover all organ systems with a more surgical and anatomic focus. Remember that most of the surgery shelf is actually internal medicine. The reason for this is that a lot of the things that you learn on surgery are actually very difficult to test in a multiple choice format. Because the surgery shelf and step two are based on vignettes, they're not going to be testing you on the minutiae that you're learning in the OR or anatomic relations. Instead, they'll test things that are more floor surgery, which is essentially internal medicine. For pediatrics, especially if you're studying step one, it's a fantastic way to go back to the basic sciences. Things like biochemistry, genetics, and immunology all show up again on the pediatric shelf. Remember that many congenital conditions actually involve a lot of basic science topics. The difference between pediatrics and step one is that pediatrics is where the abstract concepts become more real. You tend to be tested a lot more on the clinical applications and the presentations of these basic science concepts. On OB-GYN, it's a fantastic opportunity to learn reproductive endocrinology and embryology. For the psychiatry shelf exam, it's almost identical to the material that you're going to need to know for step one and also the material that you'll need to know for step two. In addition, because psychiatry rotations are often lighter, it'll give you time to prepare for shelf exams that maybe you didn't learn as well before or to cover other step one or step two material that you aren't going to be able to cover in your other shelf exams. For family medicine, you'll have another opportunity to cover most of the organ systems and to do a lot more with prevention and public health. Notice if you prepare for your shelf exams in this way, it's going to make step one and step two prep that much easier. For step one in general, you want to focus on the basic sciences. Make sure that you understand the pathophysiology and core clinical concepts and that you can apply them to the clinical scenarios. For step two, it's really simple. Just never forget what it is that you're learning for each shelf exam. In general, shelf exams tend to be more detailed than the material that you're going to see on step two. For that reason, if you can maintain the knowledge that you've obtained on the shelf exams, it's going to make your step two prep that much easier. Ultimately, this allows you to study for almost all of your exams at the same time, not just step one, step two, and the current shelf exam for the rotation that you're on. But in addition, because there's so much overlap between the different shelf exams, studying for one is also going to help you for future exams. In other words, if I know internal medicine well, it's also going to help me for surgery and family medicine. If you make sure that everything you learn, you learn well, and you never forget, this will leave only a very small part of the material for dedicated study time, which brings us to strategy number eight, the 10% dedicated study hack. If you follow this system, you'll reach dedicated study periods with about 90% of the work already done. We've had multiple students take step one and step two within a month of each other and do well on both. Most students will waste their dedicated studying, relearning things that they've forgotten from their rotations. By following the strategy, you'll be able to set yourself apart by polishing what you already know. So how should you spend dedicated study time? If you've mastered the step one material in each of your clerkships, you'll likely have very little left. If you've been consistent, there may only be 10 or 20% of the material that you haven't really seen yet. Because the focus of step one is really just to pass, you may find that you're already passing at the time that your dedicated period starts. For this reason, you're going to want to take an NBME and assess the likelihood of you passing. A 65% on an NBME is roughly a 95% chance of passing, whereas a 70% or higher gives you roughly a 99% chance of passing. If you're still not at that 65 or 70% level, there's going to be opportunities for you to boost your score. These leftover standalone topics might be parts of embryology or immunology or biochemistry or microbiology. In addition, if you didn't find this video early in your rotations, there may be earlier rotation material that you need to brush up on. For example, if I didn't make cards for my psych rotation material and I forgot a lot of it, your dedicated period is a great time to go back and brush up on the material. This eight strategy system transforms how you study during clerkships, but knowing what to study is only half the battle. To truly honor shelf exams and score 260 plus in step two, you also need to master how to approach each question. Watch my video, how to boost your USMLE score instantly next. These question interpretation techniques have helped my students improve by 20 to 30 points in just weeks. And they work for all exams, shelf exams, step one and step two. The difference between honoring and passing isn't just what you know, it's how you approach each question.